Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Welcome to the Mastery Mix Podcast. My name is Mike and Davina, and thanks for hanging out with me today. Today, my guest is Nicholas Varns, and if you're not familiar with him, he is a Grammy Award winning producer, engineer, and mixer. He's worked with artists such as Animal Collective, Dirty Projectors, Deer Hunter, The War on Drugs, and so many more. And in this conversation today, we get into, we get pretty deep about music, and we get into the idea of really finding the individuality in an artist and how to get that unique artist sound to come out of your speakers. And when you're working, whether it's your own music or whether you're working with another artist, it's how do you figure out what the sound of an artist should be? Because we all come at this from multiple influences, but we're also very individual and very unique. And we bring our own combination of multiple influences together to create the music we make. So it's kind of like, you know, are we making records that sound like our favorite artists or are we making records that sound like ourselves? And when you listen to any of the records that Nicholas has made, they're very unique. And that is one of the things that I really love about him. And he just makes really, really cool records that I think have a lot of uniqueness, a lot of character to them and a lot of size. And they all sound different from each other. And because of that, they all sound really, really cool. So in this interview, we get right into all of that stuff. And you can tell that Nicholas is a very introspective kind of guy. And it sounds like when he works on records, he helps artists get introspective with themselves as well. So yeah, I think this is a really interesting interview. So with that said, let's just jump right into it. Nicholas Ferenc, thank you so much for being on the Master Your Mix podcast. For people who might not be familiar with you, who you are and what you do, can you give us a little bit of your background on who you are and how you ultimately got into all of this? My name is Nicholas Varens, and I'm a producer, engineer, and mixer. I'm also a musician. And I started interning in a studio in the mid-90s. I was making a record in Hartford, Connecticut, at a place called Studio 45, with Michael Deming, engineering and producing. And we spent a, a week or so in there making a, a record. And I was so impressed with what can happen, even once you've already recorded the instruments, what can happen just listen back to the mix you know or the temporary mix rough mix over speakers this is on tape so all the faders are where they should be and you sort of get to a spot where it sounds pretty good and i was asking him all these questions eventually what i did is i uh was thinking about doing a, a, a school in new york to learn about engineering learn about the techniques and i went to visit that school and it was horrendous it was uh <laughs> just really bad 94 era amateur hip hop and metal. That was it. There was no like singer songwriters. There was no like noise bands. It was just these two mainstays of the industry. And these kids were trying to, you know, learn those crafts and get in there. So I talked to Michael and I said, well, instead of doing that, what, you know, would you be into the idea of me interning here like three, four days a week? And then after a few months, we'll see where we are. And he said, sure. So he gave me a place to crash, which was the couch of the control room. And uh, I'd be there for Monday through about Thursday. And then we'd have rehearsals and shows on the weekends with my band. And after, yeah, four or five months, I felt like I had the basics under my belt and had so much more information than if I hadn't done that. For sure. <laughs> because it was specifically with bands of this nature, kind of mixing noise and rock and pop and sort of like a more challenging uh, style of music than the, I guess, more obvious at the time, uh, things on mainstream radio. And that was very important for me because I was able to go into a small space, buy a little bit of gear, and already I had a fairly good sense of... Um, how to listen for the room and how to move things around and not be afraid to experiment for the sake of getting the result that was in my or the musician's head. At first it was my band. Um, so we would just leave everything set up and we had a great kind of rehearsal space slash recording studio. And then after a little while, some friends were like, hey, you, you have a little space over there we hear, you know, pre-internet rumor mill. And I said, yeah, I have a little space. And they're like, could we record a single there? That was a band <laughs> called Versus. 
And I was like, sure. It took me 10 minutes to push all the buttons until I heard the bass come through the speakers. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, I was doing it super cheap. It was like a hundred bucks for the day. I was like, it's really for me. <laughs> I was telling them <laughs> that I needed the time to figure this stuff out. And it was just the routing of the console. It was a Trident 65, which was an inexpensive analog console. And I'd bought a 3MM79 24 track, two inch deck, a couple microphones. I was using just the pre's on the board. Maybe I'd bought like an API 3124 for high, higher quality, um, dedicated mic pre. And I had like one compressor and that was kind of it for a couple of years. I just, that was enough because the tape does so much. And that's something that's going to be hard for people to relate to today. But as difficult as it is to maintain, calibrate and operate a tape machine and deal with the fact that sometimes a channel doesn't work and things like this that impede the workflow. What the tape does is it being a linear system, the band's going to have to do all the heavy lifting for getting that performance to be what it is. And they should, of course, because it makes all the difference in the world. This is also kind of people were using click tracks if they were doing something where they wanted an absolutely even tempo, but rock bands would love to play with tempo and dynamics and tempo is one of those dynamics. It's a time dynamic. But if you remove that and the song is exactly the same speed from front to end, uh, for a lot of music, that just does not work. And some music is written with time signature changes and tempo changes because those are natural parts of filling out a song and, and talking to the song and answering the song that things will naturally be better at a different tempo. And, oh, well, we're a different tempo than the verse. It's like, well, there's no cut and paste anyway. It doesn't matter. Does it work <laughs> as a listening experience? Are you getting goosebumps? Are you getting really excited? Because those are really the indicators for how well things are going and whether or not you're making the right decisions is that as you work on it more and more, it starts to become its own thing. And you become the shepherd of that thing, of that vision, of sonic vision. Um, and everyone in the room also does. And so everybody kind of chimes in and says things about how they feel things are going. And then you find that beautiful balance where everyone's kind of in a good place. And it's not like, well, I want the bass to be louder than the drums because I can't hear it. It's like, well, if it's in the right place and there's a space carved out for it, you shouldn't have any issues hearing any instrument. And that comes down more to arrangement and composition in the end. So it was fun to layer a bunch of guitars, but is that going to really translate into an emotional response from the listener's perspective other than fulfilling some fantasy somebody has of going to studio and I want like, you know, 10 overdubs of guitars doing similar things. So it's this wall of sound. Maybe you can do it with one or two. My Belly Valentine certainly did without having to, you know, I mean, they did go crazy in some ways, <laughs> <laughs> which is beautiful because that's exactly what people should be doing with recording. They should push it to the limit and once they go past it, you kind of know it, you sense it. You're like, that doesn't work for this part. It's a yeah. cool experiment that was awesome, but it didn't serve the song. And I think listening to a few of the podcasts you did in the past, I noticed a lot of people are very, very alert to that fact. They kind of like how much is enough, how much is too much, how do we change things up from section to section? Those are all things that are kind of predicated by the song, asking of the musicians and anybody else in the room, a producer, engineer, to give it their all, all their attention, to try to capture a version of that fleeting moment and or to create that fleeting moment. Because a lot of production is also into like creating moments by making uh, technical and uh, production decisions that you know have an impact. Uh, of course. A little, you know, the very big sections that make everybody feel really happy, they're really in contrast to other sections that aren't quite that done up and decorated and filled and space is left. And then when that space gets filled, there's a sense of satisfaction and as well when it stops and now we're back to something more uh, light on its feet. And so those are uh, contrasts that are really important to, uh, to keep in mind. But I think it's very important to try. And where it becomes very difficult, I think, for people, let's say you're a songwriter, 
you don't really want to bother thinking that much about production and technical stuff. Do I have the right mic on the guitar? It's the mic that's on there now. It sounds like the guitar, close <laughs> enough. And now I'm actually working out the song. I need to work on that. And I can't really dedicate both parts of my brain or one of the two parts of my brain to um, keep an eye on the technical aspect other than maybe like clipping, you know. Yeah. Uh, and the rest of it is going to be how can I hone my performance? So the one way around that I, I feel is to have kind of downtime where you know you're not really making your masterpiece at that moment, but you're sort of preparing for making your uh, masterpiece <laughs> yeah. or a crappy song, whichever one it happens to be, somewhere in between. And so that's going to be the kind of like playing. It's like playing, having fun, doing stuff you would never do. You're just having fun. You're not expecting any results. Take all the pressure off. When it comes time to record, that is in your mind already. You've already tried that. It might come in handy, but you don't need to have it front and center in your brain to go on and just do a really good demo because you know the demo is going to really stand on its ability to convey that feeling even with just a few instruments. And then as you add more, maybe that even goes further and further and you really open up the sonics and they serve the song and as the song is really flying and you feel really good about that. And if you're not, you have to always be ready to, in an experimental way, okay, went down that road, that was really cool. I'm not sure that's the right way. If you can, if you have the patience, try another way. And if you go to the point where you have no patience, do something else, go for a walk and don't let yourself be caged by your own mind and your own kind of uh, the things you'd be expecting to happen. Because yes, it's nice to have a master plan in your head. It's also very, very important to be lithe enough to deviate from that plan and not feel like you've lost your way. For sure. There, there's so much that you just said there to like unpack. And uh, yeah, I'd love to dive into a little bit more about some of that. But um, I guess one of the one of the things that you said early on was this idea of like production decisions versus like kind of like natural feel and, and you know, really preserving the moment. Um, and I think that's a really interesting thing, because like, you know, even even as someone who teaches people how to record themselves, it's like, there, there are a lot of production decisions made in a lot of these records that we listen to. So there's that natural inclination to say like, OK, well, like double tracking guitars or adding layers, or whatever, like that's that's what's happening on a lot of these big records. And so because we hear it on these big records, we feel like we need to do it. But th there is also like kind of what you said there. It's like there's a point where like maybe the, what's where it started is actually the best form. And that's an interesting that's an interesting decision for an engineer or producer to have to make to like decide which is the best thing to do. Right. And, and, and for the band to also see that that is the best call. So um, for you in, in that position where, when you're producing, how do you go about that? Like, does it just, is it just that people are trusting you because you know, they're hiring you as a producer. So they're just trusting your, your vision for it. Or how do you, how do you make those decisions? To a certain extent, I think they um, there's definitely that part of it. That's why they chose to work with me. But hopefully it's not to replicate anything in particular they've heard. I'm hoping they just get a sense that I'm the right fit for their vision and their ideas. Um, and if all they're trying to do is replicate something that exists already kind of to a T, that's a different job in a sense. And there are people who are excellent. For example, you want to do kind of a garage retro track but the person's really done like art rock and noise like what how do you think they're going to be able to do that well i think the flexibility of a good engineer or a good producer or anybody who's in the room with with the band is to not think of themselves at all and think of the song and if the band is like oh we want to sound like the smashing pumpkins but they're not then maybe you develop your own vocabulary that addresses the same desires, right? So the desires would be like hyper melodic, fluid, very heavy at times. If the band has that in it, then just find that language for that band and that'll make that record unique. Will it be like a quasi hit because it doesn't quite sound like the pumpkins? I don't think so. And I think that if you get roped into another band's aura because you approach their sonic detail, that's their sonic detail, not yours. 
Yeah, that's interesting. The reason why they're so who they are is because they actually spend the time, often the years, to develop that vocabulary. And that's what you'll have to do as well. You'll have to do the same thing. And it's very rewarding, but you, it's not like a, I don't, I don't see too many shortcuts in that approach. Um, people end up with kind of lo-fi recordings by necessity. Perhaps that's the gear they have, and they're kind of happy with a less hyped sound where everything's so pristinely detailed that, you know, you're so happy to hear this representation. But really, if, if the song is like a bit of a dream, then it's totally fine if it sounds like that. If it sounds a bit washed out and imprecise, because it's not, you know, progressive jazz. For sure. Where you're just listening back to the performance and what, you know, when you make sure all the players are playing together. In a lot of rock, that stuff sort of doesn't quite center around the quality of the performance in the same way. Um, sometimes it could be done for effect. In that case, somebody could be very effective picking a bunch of pedals they've never used, stringing them together, and just seeing what happens. Like, oh, that's the wrong sound, but wow, that sounds really cool. Maybe that is not the wrong sound. Whereas, you know, within reason, I think people have their, you know, a guitar player will be like, I'm that style of guitar player, and this is what I do, so I want to use that amp and that guitar, and then I get that sound. And then you've got people who don't want to sound like anybody else, whether it brings them, uh, you know, any kind of recognition. I don't think they're doing it for that. Yeah. And that's going to be translated in the work. In the end, people do really appreciate independent, unique bands who are willing to take a risk. And there's, I think, in the end also, the, the, the great thing about all these options is hopefully you get to make decisions about all these options as you go. And they'll all add up to something a little different. I've been asked to make a couple of records to sound like other records. And I was like, no, <laughs> I want you to be proud of what you're doing and hone in on that thing with that very special thing. And I think that's where producers sometimes more than engineers, but sometimes both. That's kind of the job before anything else to yeah. really coax the individuality out of the um, band that very specific group of people play in a very specific way. Why water it down? Why not just enhance it? And then you're really getting that full experience. And if you like it, you're like, that's my band. And it doesn't sound <laughs> like other bands. You can feel really close to that. Um, do I think about that while I'm working? Probably not a lot. Um, that's how I think in general. I'd love to go back to um, what you were talking about earlier with like bands and like their identity and that kind of stuff. Um, so you, you talked about how like, some bands, you know, like you said, like the Smashing Pumpkins example, I think there's a lot of bands that like, we all have our influences as musicians and we all, you know, we've been inspired to play because of other bands we love and that kind of stuff and maybe even tones and that kind of thing. So I think naturally we have like a lot of musicians have this natural um, attraction to a certain style or a certain band or a certain sound or whatever. And I also think that there's a lot of artists that, no matter what, once they start, once they finish recording, they're listening to some of those earlier records that they love to compare how their new record sounds against those. And, and so there's always that kind of like comparison game to some degree. But I love what you said about like bands finding their own sound and like kind of finding what makes them unique and, and how they all play together and that kind of thing. Um, so I'm curious to dive into that a little bit more as far as like when you start working with an artist and, you know, maybe they come to you saying like, oh, like, we like the Smashing Pumpkins, you know, like, I don't know why that's going to be the reference from now that's, on. That's a reference we stuck with. So whatever, <laughs> but, there you, go. but you know, but it's like, something. you know, let's, let's say that is kind of like a sound that they're going for. And then you're seeing like, okay, well, yeah, I could tell that maybe that's your like playing and influence or whatever, but you don't quite sound like that. Like, how do you go about um, helping them maybe discover what direction they should be going more into? That's a good question. How do you, like shepherd somebody's creativity to hone in not on the person that they're aiming for as far as like a contemporary or somebody in the past who was a great player. I mean, I think you're right. We all come from somewhere and more and more so because I feel it's hard to avoid the 
on a total amount of recorded music that you can stream. Although I know that's not true. I have records that aren't online and I sometimes seek those out because it makes the experience really exciting to know that that's just not an easy thing to do, but it takes work and research. As far as helping someone hone in on themselves, that's it. You help someone hone in on themselves when they start messing around with the patches on the guitar and like, you know, plugging in different things and you hear something really, really interesting that has nothing to do with the pumpkins, <laughs> but you're something like where they're connecting with that in, in, in their own um, creativity. You're there going like, yeah, that's cool. That's really, that's very specific and maybe specific to that song. That's always beautiful too, because it's so easy to be like, well, that's my chorus kind of like, you know, when I go to a chorus part, that's kind of the sound I usually go for. And if you're playing live a lot, that makes sense. You need to have kind of a verse feel and a, and a chorus feel slash sound. When you're recording, you can kind of mess with that a lot. And again, not to upend the song, you're serving the song. And hopefully the people in the room have an understanding that to an extent they themselves are a vessel as well. They're a link between something out there, ideas, desires, imagination, the universe, and like a singular piece of music. I feel that that's, uh, that's a cool endeavor. It's a really interesting endeavor to channel that. And I feel that a lot of musicians kind of know that intuitively. They have a sense of themselves as well. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not egoless. <laughs> But it doesn't mean they're egotistical either. It might just mean they have a good sense of who they are and they can still be fine with the idea that there's this, they're, they're kind of like a surfer on culture. Yeah. Gathering these things, going this way and that way, letting themselves kind of naturally end up where the forces are pushing them, um, which is a really beautiful thing to do. All the once in a while, you have to paddle for 10 minutes and nothing happens. If that discourages you, then you're probably not made for this kind of stuff because it's going to be a lot of ups and downs. And as a musician, you don't have to block yourself from feeling happy or disappointed. You should just feel happy when you're happy and disappointed when you're disappointed. Just face up to it. I, both will pass to another moment. Um, but people who are introverted and yet are very comfortable on stage, you know, in front of strangers have made this pact with themselves that they're okay with that. This is totally fine. They're not talking to a friend. They're talking to a bunch of people they don't know, and they can kind of become themselves at that moment. It's kind of interesting. So people who are introverted, you just have to listen to them a little more. It might take a little longer to get around to what would be ideal for them to achieve what they want to do. Uh, and it's case by case in the sense that the headphone monitor becomes really, really important. I was just tracking a band at Studio 606 in LA, which was a great space. Um, and at some point, somebody was playing at a time and they didn't even make it through the take. So I was like, do you mind if I listen to what your headphone mix is like? It's like, oh, go ahead. Let them play back the song. And the studio had something very good for people who know how to use it, a 16-channel mixer per musician. Oh, wow. Full control over the mix with everything labeled, EQ on each channel, like a Mackie 1608 or something, 1602. And um, that works great if you know how to do that. And if you don't, you're better off maybe having somebody either make the mix for you where everything's kind of audible and then ask for preferences. Who are you playing most with? You know, you want to really hear the drums if you're the bass player? It's like, probably, yeah. Uh, but this person had just accidentally made their mix insane. <laughs> and as a result, we're playing. And most people should know that because live, if you can't really hear what's happening, it's very frustrating. You know, there's a big rumble for the bass instead of the notes. You just feel the sub under the stage. Um, being aware of that and correcting that sound check is really important. Um, 
but that helps you get to where you want to be. Again, back to the introverted person who's not going to be super vocal about what they need. Just let them speak when they speak. Lots of stuff packed in there that will help and help you do your job better, which is kind of translate that vision into something like, oh, they just mean they'd like the Tom mic to be over here. There's less attack and it sounds better to them. Great. I think we got that, you know, yeah. but it might, they might not know how to say that. So it's very important to be very, to be open and intuitive and to listen and to have all three things happening in balance so that the person feels comfortable. They've expressed any issues they may have. And maybe in the meantime, you've made them comfortable enough to do what they wanted to do. And in a big recording studio or a small recording studio, that's what you're there for. You're there to facilitate that translation from that strange idea into something that plays back over the speakers and has a beautiful flow to it. So, yeah, that's kind of like talking about how to help people <laughs> hone in on their uh, sound while also using that as a way to explain every other part of it, even for, for sure. the people who are very, very uh, good at expressing what they need. It'll take less work on your end to interpret what they mean, but it's so important to work with people who aren't very good at doing that because it might, it might mean they're very, very good at something else. Absolutely. Something within the songwriting craft, they have a magical ability to do. Yeah, they can't set a compressor. So what? You're here for that. Yeah. You help them do that. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, musicians aren't really coming to the studio. Like, you know, most of them aren't coming to the studio as engineers themselves and knowing everything. So it's like they're there to just play their music and you're there to make it sound the best it can. And you have to decipher what they mean. And that's part of the job. Like you got to learn the the musician language or lack thereof. Um, and uh, and you just have to figure out how to put that all together to ultimately make that vision come to life. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's I, a wonderful way to approach um, kind of teamwork. And to know that what you're doing is really contributing to somebody's creative life. Yeah. You're really um, significant in that sense. Stay humble about it, of course, but significant in that you're facilitating. You're, you're really supporting that vision, that, that you know, the artist's vision. Um, and in general, it's hard to go wrong with that mm -hmm. because... That's the role. Yeah. Um, the The other role is kind of different. It's quite different, actually. The The producer role where it's, let's say, it's not a band. It's a singer-songwriter with songs on the piano or on the guitar or whatever their, you know, accompanying instrument is. That's always very, very different because no one's played a beat to this stuff yet. No one's written a bass line. No one's figured out a harmony. No one's helped figure out the structure necessarily either. So that openness on one hand is amazing because you know the band has made decisions beforehand. They've rehearsed things. You're happy mm -hmm. they have. You like them. You like to work with them. That's why you're there. A singer-songwriter with essentially, you know, chords and a melody and words. Wow, that can go so can go many totally different, different places. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in a way that has more potential for totally messing it up in a way. But that's kind of the beauty of it. You know, those things that are so fragile. Yeah. You just need to spend even more time caring about them because someone hasn't done all the other work ahead of time. Yeah. To the structure. You're right. But it's like a band setting. Like they've been rehearsing these songs for months sometimes. And yeah. they've already gone through all of the different versions and arrangements and parts right. and all that stuff. So, so like when you're in a singer songwriter position, you're now condensing that into however long you have to work with someone. So, um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah. And, and what's interesting, kind of about the next phase of what I'm doing is I definitely want to produce an engineer and mix. But back in the day, like in the early 2000s, by kind of like I was helping a band put together a concept record, 
and I helped write some of the tunes um, and contributed to writing some of the tunes. And that was really fun. That was really fun. And I hadn't gotten to do that in quite a while, but apparently it's not uncommon in LA in particular to have writing sessions with people who have, you know, a good core song and kind of don't know where to go, but you don't want to like rent a studio for that for, you know, whatever, you know, hundreds of dollars an hour. You can be in a little production room with an acoustic guitar and just work through structure, work through ideas, play with the tempo, play with the range, uh, things that you don't necessarily consider when you're writing a song. You're just like the emotions overwhelming. This is what you want to get across. Did you pick the right key for your voice? If you're beginning, there's a chance maybe you didn't. So looking at that is really cool. And I think it makes everybody feel that uh, a lot of attention is being paid to the details that will make the performance later much easier. Uh, unless you're looking to push the singer to their limit because that creates a, an angst and a tension in a chorus where you know that's the highest note they can hit. You're going to hear that. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to hear that and that's going to create something. If they're super comfortable at the highest note and somehow that's supposed to be dramatic, it won't sound nearly as strained. <laughs> and playing with these things is really fun. Um, and a lot of options as well for arrangement. Yeah. And, uh, and more than even when the band's already... This is a good anecdote, though. A, a band I was recording had done... The lead singer had done demos and uh, the band had taken the demos, worked on them for a bit, and then we were in the studio together. And that's what I'd heard. I'd heard like the demos of once the band was there. For a song, I was kind of feeling like drum part, cool drum part, like kind of like the last song's drum part. What was the original demo like? And the lead singer looks at me, he's like, you want to hear the original demo? Like the four track drum machine thing? I'm like, <laughs> Absolutely. And that was so cool. That version <laughs> was so eerie and bizarre. And he didn't have a drummer. He put like a crappy drum machine, kind of distorted it, gave it some personality and just performed the song. And we took a lot from that idea. We took a lot from that idea of, it's not just parts upon parts upon parts. And then here comes a new part. You're going to, oh, we should do a fill there. No, don't do any fills crash on all the downbeats, never crash on the downbeats. It, it, you know, once the bands already got their thing and they have their part, but it worked out, they were open to it. And we did a version kind of B version of it, which ended up on the record, which was super quirky and bizarre, which I still love to this day because it was much closer to the demo. That's not necessarily a good thing, right? But it was much closer to the spirit of the song. The first time it was really committed to tape. Gotcha. And there was something there. There was a little magic moment there that once it got glossed over and developed and opened up and everything, once you get to that spot, it was a more standard version of that thing. So we just made it kind of weird and it yeah. worked well for the song because it kind of called for that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it kind of ties back to what you were talk about, talked about earlier, which is like, you know, some people kind of are focused on the production side of things while they're writing. And like, sometimes they're not. And sometimes you get that, that magic thing that just happens like a, that shitty drum machine or whatever, you know, that ends up being the, the cool thing that makes that track what it is and, uh, and makes the writer lean into that. So uh, yeah, I love that story. That's, that's a very cool story. Um, I'd love to dive a little bit more into some, like some of the sonic elements of your productions that I really love um, to learn a little bit more about, about uh, your production decisions there. Um, and one thing that I've noticed with a lot of your, your mixes that I really love, especially with like the stuff like the, the war on drugs records and that kind of stuff um, is that you seem to, you seem to lean into a lot of like room sounds or maybe it's reverb and delay and that kind of stuff. Um, and often that roominess plays a really big role in creating the overall sound or vibe and, and size of the song. Um, and so I'm curious to know, like when it comes to ambience in a mix, what's your philosophy on, you know, capturing that ambience, either using like real microphones and, and using the, the actual room versus adding it in post and, you know, relying on like plugins or whatever. Good question. Um, it's a multi-part answer. The first part would be if I'm recording, if I was recording, you know, in my space where I kind of know how things sound, the function of the room mics will be pretty straightforward. I'm kind of 
waiting for the time on the snare drum decay to kind of fit inside the tempo of the song. So if you have a room mic that's maybe, you know, 20 feet away, but you can press it, your snare drum may last until the next kick, which is different than boom, tsh, boom, tsh, boom, tsh, boom, tsh, boom. So that it feels, it makes a feeling very different. Uh, you can do that, of course, with digital reverb. You can time your decay time on a snare reverb, but then you get this big reverb snare, which if it's so obviously being created primarily by the reverb, that's going to mark it sonically as a kind of like modified, digitally modified sound or even analog reverb, a little probably more forgiving, but that's going to be a very distinctive sound. If you still want a pretty natural kit where you're not asking any questions as a listener as to what's going on, this is an important point to stop on. Um, and this is a good exercise for people to do kind of with headphones on, let's say, soul music from the 60s. Like, listen to that stuff. Listen to what's going on. You might think there's no reverb on the vocals, and then there's a little passage, and you're like, oh, my God, that's like three seconds ago, and there's still a tale of it because the band dropped out. So why are they putting it at all if I'm not noticing? Well, you will notice it. Put a very long, quiet reverb on a singer. Bring it up until you can barely tell it's there. Drop it a bit. Leave it in the song where that is. Next listen, mute it. It's going to feel very different. That's hyper subtle stuff. Which people use a lot, by the way. That is one of the yeah, things. Of it's like half you know, subliminal, essentially. Um, I did a song recently where it was pretty fast tempo for whatever reason, a long snare reverb kind of worked. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, there's no way it's like, it's <laughs> going to still be going. I mean, it, it, it kind of created this aura around the, the, the kit that was really useful for the one song. So if you are using effects, um, you know, lay with the effect itself it's not enough just put it on no there you go there's the effect uh what i'll do with effects returns is i'll do a lot of uh, shaping upon the return so i'll have an eq on there afterwards before if it sounds better if for some reason feeding that effect less low end makes the effect different than just removing the low end afterwards then so you can put one before and one after and maybe even a little compression on things like a reverb if you're trying to achieve a very predictable you know glacially even sound that could help because the snare could hit the uh you know the snare could hit hard that'll send a lot more signal to the reverb now your reverb's completely out of control so not only are you trying to limit the dynamics of the snare itself so that it's just very metronomic and hypnotic in some cases but you don't want the effects to blow out here and there either. So you might want to do some dynamic control on that. You could also write a fader, of course, because you can go through it and be like, oh, that's just too much. And um, Or in the end, for me, in the end, it's usually a combination of both. I create a dynamic control, and then I want to automate that dynamic control either by like writing the master fader or changing the threshold. Changing the threshold is really cool as an automation. You're really changing the character of you're not just lowering the finished product. Now you're driving into the compressor at higher or lower levels or an effect. And that could be great because if, let's say, you're driving things at a certain level for the verses, you could change it for the chorus. It changes that character. Now the chorus have their own distinct sound. And all it took is like a little volume automation on the send to feed that or to feed, for example, a parallel bus that has everything. Maybe for certain sections, an entire group of instruments, it's harder for that. You can't really compensate for that by doing it on the out, I think. It just sounds different. So I tend to like mush it in first and mush it in more and then mush it in less. And then all the controls are kind of available. Um, for people who are using Pro Tools, Pro Tools has two options for that kind of stuff. You can either individually decide which parameter you'd like to modify, which is 
pretty insane because some plugins have hundreds of parameters. If you like scroll down the list and find the thing that you're trying <laughs> to automate, or you can instantiate them with all parameters available for uh, automation. And that doesn't help you either because you don't want to automate all of them. So, um, and logic has a different way. You touch the fader, you put it in record, you move the fa- the slider you want, and that's what's being automated. Little things like that. Um, and I, f- I found, and we, we haven't gotten to this at all, but as far as the way in which your equipment influences your creativity or your workflow, very important things. Those are very, very important things. Um, if you're more likely to do the same thing twice because of your own inability to comprehend how a plugin is laid out and where and how you're going to automate it because that DAW doesn't allow you to do that, then you're not going to do it. And you're not going to do it on a session while somebody's like putting everything out there. You're not on, on you know, YouTubing how to automate some parameter. <laughs> you, you know, you're expected to know that stuff. And so I, I know people who've kind of enforced a certain DAW because that's where they can really, really do it. After that, you can always bounce down and jump into another platform. If you're happy with how that worked out. You can just bounce that out and just keep going from there if that's what it takes. Um, but if someone's struggling with sitting in front of a computer and thinking, oh, I can do anything with this, but then they realize they barely know how to do any of it, that's <laughs> going to be really annoying. And, yeah. <laughs> and it's not going to be a great feeling in terms of your ability to take advantage of the medium. You know, why was tape... A console. What was, why did that last for generations, barely being changed? Whereas we get new functions, you know, every software update there's some new function. You're like, my God, you're gonna save my life. <laughs> None of that was available, um, and in a way, a lot less processing because you couldn't. There was no point. Yeah. You're gonna insert like. 15 11 76 is on the drum bus oh, on the drum tracks you can do that now so you true. kind of feel like you have to do that now because you don't have tape like well how did they get that pushy sound how did they get that kick to be so even tape that was yeah. tape and and partially performance uh precision from the you know right or left foot of the drummer <laughs> yeah I, I often find myself like just giving myself that challenge of like how do I simplify this? Because I know that, like you said, like back in the day, they didn't have every like a gazillion 1176s or whatever, you know, it's like so it was just, they found a way to simplify the process and make it easy. And, you know, when you when you can do that, it uh, it can be very freeing to to just like dial dumb things down. And it's not even dumbing things down. It's just like being more efficient. I wonder to that end, I wonder, you know. So I was born in France, but I came to America when I was 11 and pretty much immediately started listening to the radio. But by the 80s, you have to think that they're starting to mix. They're starting to mix with some pretty heavy compression on the mix bus, kind of thanks to the SSL, which didn't have a side chain at the time. So low, a lot of low end would drag down the needle and you couldn't really get around that unless you had it rewired with an external side chain. Um, but imagine that. I remember going to a radio station, my sister's radio station, she was a couple of years older. Uh, she still is. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, there was this big red metering thing happening and I'm looking at it and I asked the guy, I was like, well, what's that? That's the output compression. Like, what's it, what's it doing? And I think he said, like, we have a 10 to one ratio and we've been told to hit 10 dBs of limiting on the loud stuff on top of whatever the record already had been limited. And then everyone grew up with that sound. <laughs> Interesting. Of hyper compression, less so in the 60s and 70s, very much so in the 80s and 90s, where it's like that becomes the sound. People start to mix into a compressor bus and they yeah. try to see like, oh, what's it doing to the drums? What's it doing to the guitar? It's making my mix polished. It's doing all the work for me. Um, but um, had we not had that, I don't know if people would have. Uh, I don't know if people. Uh, and I think they were doing that also because there weren't really standards for output levels for records on vinyl. Mm-hmm. If your record was long, you couldn't print it that hot. 
right? You had to like back off yeah. the volume to be able to fit that many minutes of material because the gap would open up and then that would make less room for the next track and then it's cumulative. So if you wanted 20 minutes on one side, which is trying to push it, your record gets progressively less low end and less very top as you make the groove smaller. And that's kind of a compression help with that. If you could control where the needle was when it was making its mark while you're making a master, you can control a needle while after hundreds of revolutions, you've controlled exactly the width of the track with a limiter on the actual head, which is what the Fairchilds were designed for. You're controlling the voltage going to that and you're controlling the width exactly of um, the, the mark you're making. And yeah, you can get a little more music out of that if you have an incredibly you know experienced mastering engineers, which by definition, they have to be. They make a record a day, maybe five records a day, and they have that issue to this day. Mm -hmm. To this day, you want vinyl? Well, there are physical issues with vinyl that your MP3 doesn't really... I mean, your MP3 has physical <laughs> issues. They're different. <laughs> yeah. But uh, they're more, yeah, mathematical and, and, and algorithmic. Yeah. So, yeah, back to the uh, console and the tape machine. Uh, the workflow, yeah. The workflow, if you feel like you're not good at your DAW, I don't know watch youtube i know people who've just taken like a week-long course and now they're like they're like good at this yeah and this way it gets out of the way you kind of want that stuff to get out of the way of course um as early as possible you know yeah but you definitely have to know your tools and and it's interesting like hearing you talk about you know automating your your effects and and the th the threshold on a compressor and that kind of stuff like it is very interesting and, and i was very curious to know how much processing you did you know with your effects because that that's one of the things i noticed is that like your tracks like you know you take that war on drugs record for example like the there's so much spaciness and the reverb or the roominess is all really really loud but everything is still super clear and i think that that's a problem that a lot of people have when it comes to um adding reverb is that they just kind of throw it up and it makes their makes it sound really muddy whereas like you're able to make it super loud, but also like super clear and everything still has its has its space. And kind of like what you talked about at the beginning, where it's like, yeah, you're just really making space for each instrument so that things just kind of naturally live. And it sounds like you're making the reverb or the room mics or whatever it is, you're making that its own instrument. So it has its own space in, in your tracks, too. Yeah, um, there's a good um, example of that was... Um... People with chambers and plates, which now, of course, have been emulated, uh, would filter what they were sending before it hit the room. And so if you send a full frequency signal, let's say on a vocal to a room, that low, low, low stuff is going to get through. The sibilance is going to get through. If you just want it to be a discrete version of the vocals where it's not screaming like I have reverb on my voice, get rid of a bunch of lows, roll off a bunch of highs, concentrate on where the vocals really sit, like the sweetness part of the vocal range, and ignore the very top and the very bottom. Send that to your reverb, and you can do that on a doll really easily uh, by just putting an insert before the reverb, shaping it. Nowadays, I feel like they've already thought of that in a lot of plugins and put in a set of filters inside there. Don't be afraid to use those aggressively. Yeah. You'd have a reverb on something be just the high end, like on an acoustic guitar. Maybe you just want the reverb to be this like weird fluttering thing that's catching all the high strings and it sounds like a mandolin or something. Um, and if you're doing bass, you can totally do reverb on bass. Absolutely. That was done in the past and it, it, there's a reason for that. If you're playing very staccato, you can create a slightly longer kind of decay. And if you get it feeling right, the player can actually play to that and it could be really fun. And that's true for absolutely everything. One of the things, having had a studio where it was kind of, you basically had the time you had when everyone was there. That was the record. You can't really go back a month later and be like, I think I made a better version of this. Like, oh, we already sent it to the press. You're like, okay, never mind. Um, but people sitting there with their project for weeks, months, years, feeling like, oh, it's not where I want it to be. I mean, that's the principal drive for learning to get better 
at what you're doing. And part of that is psychological. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you should know your tools. Yeah, of course, you're not going to write a song if you can't put a bar, you know, a chord together and have a sense of harmony and melody. But beyond that, maybe if a song's been lingering too long in its current state and it's just at 83%, be courageous. Yeah. Throw it out. Yeah, love it. <laughs> just do it. You could always go back. You're not, you're not, you, know, you didn't destroy the file. You're just giving yourself the ability to get to where you want to get to, not in the way in which you've been doing it up until that moment. Right? Because you said it's, a, it's a hundreds of decisions, thousands of decisions, and they get you to a certain spot. And if that spot is not where you thought you were going to end up <laughs> and you're stuck there and you can kind of see the end point for like, how do I get over that mountain over there? Oh, I have to take a completely different route. I mean, if you have time on your hands and you're willing to explore that, there's a good chance in many cases it'll be very fruitful. And if it's not, it's, it's learning. Fair, you can yeah. totally make a mistake. Yeah, you can make a mistake. You, can, you should be making mistakes all the time. That means you're at the edge of your ability. If you're, everything's comfy and great, and I think you should really um, risk some big things. Just always be aware of the fact that there's other people in the room whose music it is. So do that while knowing that for sure those two things at the same time you know yeah you either you either win or you learn that you know that's kind of the way to look at it right? totally <laughs> and you learn a lot of things i remember uh this is a really good story so back in the day when they had tape machines and um and consoles to be a, a tape op tape operator that was kind of like you know working the tape machine and i remember somebody uh doing a big record interviewing someone about i think it was like to make a huge record and they're interviewing engineers. And I think the question, like the last question was, what's the worst mistake you've ever made? You know, somebody said, Oh, uh, I once completely erased the chorus vocals by accident while doing a guitar overdub. Hired. <laughs> you know, that never guy's make, not going to make that decision will again. <laughs> never, ever make, plus the courage to admit it. Yeah. And be like, that's just what happened. That's the person you can work with. The person is like, nah, nothing bad. And then they erase the course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> now you can't do that anymore. But I think the, I think, you know, your ability to be honest about these things and be proud of the fact that you're kind of made of the things that worked out really well. And I think most people are like, oh, that person, look how everything worked out really well for them. If you ask that person, they can spend a few minutes telling you what didn't work. You just never, ever heard it. You never saw it. It's just out of their thing. Um, and you know, they, they know, and they're even more like proud and happy to have all the good things happen because they know at any given moment, things can fall apart. It can, it just can. Yeah, of course. No, that, that's, that's definitely a good way of putting it. Good, good, good uh, story too. Um, another element of your productions that I wanted to dive into is um, just overall with like the Sonics, you know, I, I feel like you tend to lean into some more like darker, kind of more saturated kind of tones. And um, I think that, that that in itself creates like a, a, a unique vibe to a lot of tracks. And so I'm curious to know, like when it comes to using things like saturation, is that something that I know you said you like to use your tape machine? Is that something you like to use on the way in like and, and build that sat saturation on early? Or again, is that something that you might decide to add more in post i haven't played a lot with saturation um and when i have it's exceedingly specific um i really like to get something as important as the level of saturation on an instrument i kind of want the decision to be early on because imagine what the difference between like a standard drum kit and a standard bass versus a standard drum kit and a totally fuzzed out bass, it's going to change a lot of things. Yeah. They're going to have to play around each other a little differently. You know, that symbol is going to be inaudible perhaps. So maybe that's not the move for this section, but if you don't have the bass saturated yet, you're playing uh, in the dark a little bit. And if you know you're going to make these 
tonically strong records, then you want them to be at that point very, very early because trust me, that's going to be 80% of how the sound's going to end up in the end. If you do have to do something because you feel a section needs a little distortion on the snare, of course, you can add that later and that's fine. That won't probably change the world. It'll change the character of the snare. Um, but probably because I was learning how to do that when once you've committed your sound, that's kind of the sound. So if you want something extreme, go for it. Like, go for it. It should be a thing if extreme is what you want, you know. And if you're doing stuff that's not extreme at all, getting the right sound is also crucial early on. Once you sing over the guitar, if that's not the guitar, it's going to be the guitar at the end. You know, you're going to remove it and replace everything. Or eventually, you know, remove the core that you had placed originally, like the rhythm guitar, and then sing over it. Uh, if it's a kind of composition and or song where the intimacy of the relationship between that vocal and the guitar is very important, they're dancing around each other, just get it right. You want to do another few takes because you need to get it right? Get it right. You'll be so happy later. You rewind, you press play. You're like, that's it. That was That's that feeling. That's wonderful. We got that. If it's to be determined, oh my God, that's going to, I don't know how that's going to, it's hard. Um, yeah. You can imagine with electronic music production, if you're doing a lot of stuff with like, you know, virtual synths, you can, you can just keep going with that idea unless you have a lot of self-discipline. But I think a lot of people do fall into the trap of having every possible option in front of them that's never been how good music's been made, ever. It's always been constraint. It's always been lack of funds. It's always been the day's over. We have this many minutes to finish this part. It's got to be right. We have to be proud of it, but we can't spend hours on it. Do it that way. Do it that way. Let that guide you. Let all these things not be obstacles. They're all kind of road signs for how to navigate the whole thing. If that's what you have, that's what you have. If you can't make the best out of it and your excuse is, we just ran out of time, fair enough. You'll have to find some more time to do the little bit you're missing. Mm -hmm. um, so much of this is a conversation I feel like I have with myself, right? Before I can have that conversation with someone else, I need to know where I stand on these kinds of things. Um, and I think during the time you work with someone you really hone in on their tastes, their patience, what spending too much time on something or not enough time means to them. And they're really going to set the pace with you because you've made a lot of records and you're like, if we do it at this pace, come next Tuesday, we're not done. It's like, oh, what do we have to do? Well, do the same thing. It's going to take a little less time. And they go, thanks, because they don't want to <laughs> wait till why didn't you tell me this? You know, it's like Monday night and like tomorrow's the last day. You're like, what? We have seven <laughs> songs to do still. Oh, who did the time management for this record? Um, you know, this stuff happens naturally as you work in commercial facilities and you have to have a project like this with a very defined timeline. You'll figure it out. You'll make a map in your head, even if you don't write yeah. it down and you'll know that this should be done by this afternoon. Otherwise we can't get to the other parts. Um, if you're just starting to record, if you're starting to record it, and it's like kind of the beginning and you're really excited and you have a little bit of extra time, use it. Yeah, for sure. Use it. Yeah, I would also argue too that for, for people at home, like the other trap that I see is that people have infinite time. And so because of that, they tinker so much that they lose sight of where that song started and you know they're two years in and they haven't finished the song so you know there's you definitely have to put those limits on yourself too and you know say okay but this that's hard to do though yeah. and i'll give you a great example i've always been recording my own music parallel to making records what exactly do i have to show for it today you know it's the stuff that was pouring out of me. Usually completely unrelated to the project that I was working on. <laughs> like not even the same ideas. It's more like, oh, when you're around this much creativity all the time and things are happening, it inspires you because that little idea you had, suddenly you know how to get it done because you've had to do it for somebody else. So helping other people make records, 
could help you make records, or you could just say, eh, I'm not the songwriter. I'm going to not even worry about that at the end of the session, instead of staying back in the studio, picking up a guitar and like trying to work out that idea that I have in my mind. Nah, just go, go somewhere else and just finish the day and just let it be. How strong does a drive have to be to break through that kind of like easy way to approach things? It has to be pretty strong. Um, what ended up happening is my, uh, my partner and I decided to make a record of very strange music <laughs> based on uh, oscillations of binaurally detuned quartz bowls. We have a set of 24, and I have some found sounds and electronics, uh, mostly a Moog matriarch, to kind of mimic what's happening naturally between the bowls. So much like two guitar strings when you're tuning them up, you're slowly getting closer and closer to it being tuned. If you're using the other string as a reference and the beating slows down until the beating disappears, they're now in tune. We're operating with always beating, always 15 cents off. That's the nature of these bowls. You pick them as whoa, 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 when they play together, right? That's one thing. And then the pulse at which they beat is kind of the difference between the two frequencies. Give you an idea, a one hertz difference is 60 BPM. The two hertz difference between two uh, tones is 120 BPM. So it's very, wow. very, very fine what can happen with that stuff. But we get like these like super fast <laughs> sounds that are amazing. And <laughs> if she stops playing, it'll ring for like 20 seconds. They're loud. They're really loud. Um, and so we're putting a record out next year of that stuff. Um, and has any of my songwriting ever been released? Like, no. Was I just thinking it would just sit there? Kind of. I kind of <laughs> like them as being these kind of experiments in, um, like, being able to play back the idea. At the time for me was more important than necessarily sharing that idea because, probably because I didn't feel very strong as a lyricist. I was happy with my melodies. I was happy with the chord structures and the song. I was never that uh, happy about that. So, so we kind of avoided that whole thing and we're not doing it. There are no vocals on this project, yeah. even though my wife used to and still does write vocals. And it's kind of liberating. It's not really about people anymore or my story or, oh, I lost this or, yep. oh, I missed that or, oh, I made this mistake or... I think it comes down to what you said, though, right? It's like it's kind of like what's your what what's your goal with it, right? And so for some people, writing music is just that that uh, thing you keep to yourself, and it's like that expression for yourself, and and you know maybe it's like your your musical diary or whatever. And then there's other people who it's like I want to share this with others. I want that. I want other people to relate to it or whatever, right? Um, so I think that's a really good point to to bring up that music doesn't have to be for everyone. It's just got to be, you know, whatever whatever you want it to be. And people who have released music have songs they haven't. Yeah, exactly. For those kinds of reasons. Oh, it didn't really work out or I didn't feel that one was as special as the other ones. They may be right. They may be wrong. I've had a lot of people play me stuff while I was like maybe looking for an extra song for a record of stuff they were kind of like, discarded stuff and i could eventually understand why and part of it was because they hadn't pushed the song far enough something else happened at that yeah. moment they had to focus on something else the song kind of got the heat of it kind of dissipated and to rekindle that is a bit difficult and some of the stuff that they do have on them some of the stuff came together really quickly but there wasn't that much interference from the human thinking about songwriting and the history of music or any of that stuff or just expressing emotions or telling a cool story, you know, an interesting story. Um, if those things don't all happen at once, then it, it, it's, it's more work. But, you know, I'm sure everyone's got a catalog of things uh, that just don't work out. And if you don't try them, I feel like those things might end up in the songs that are really, really good. So try yeah. them now on the song that it's on. Don't, like, get, finish it as much as you can. Um, you can be unhappy with it i think that's okay that's going to push you to get better and better and better it's a it's such a progress uh, process mm -hmm. um so i was gonna say so on that topic then of you know um finishing music you know what um how, how do you decide when 
a mix is ultimately done when you're working. I'm assuming it sounds like you're just kind of going off timelines at this point. No, I mean, you work within a realistic timeline so that you get to try a few versions of everything um, because you have experience, or I have experience uh, running up to the deadline and there just wasn't enough time to really get things right on that you don't want, you really don't want that situation. I, I've been known to do an extra day or two for free just because I know it needs it. And if that was the budget, that's the budget. Good. Just at least we have that extra like 12 hours in there or more. And you, it makes a big difference. Um, when is it finished? Very often I feel if I close my eyes and run through the whole song and kind of nothing shows up, like distracts me from the experience of enjoying the song, even though I've put the entire thing together, right? I've put the whole set together. I'm part of so many decisions. If I can enjoy it as a piece of music and there isn't that weird resonant frequency on the bass on that one note when the tom hits because they're detuned you fix that somehow you just fix it <laughs> whatever carve out the lows for the one hit so they don't have that beating and funny enough of the thing um because people don't necessarily tune their toms to the key of the song you know some people do some people don't it still works most of the time because they have a good musical ear and they can kind of fit it in there um so if i'm able to go from the beginning to the end Put at a good level, close my eyes, take a minute, kind of clear your head, listen through. Yeah, you do that a couple of times until most of the issues are taken care of and the rest are kind of details. And I've always said this, but, you know, the, the monitors that professional studios have access to show you things that a lot of people will never hear in a sense, quite literally. And yet you still have to make those things work at the second and third level of, of depth of a mix that people might miss, you still want to get these things right for yourself. Mm -hmm. And then you know you've addressed all the potential issues. Um, so, yeah, I think it should sound like awesome music, and you should feel, hopefully you feel something when you listen back to it. Even if you've listened to it 15 times, 30 times, you should still have that awesomeness that you want from the song if that's what it has. And if it's sadness because of a certain way it works, and that's it should still be there. If none of these things are still <laughs> around by the time you mix a song, oops. Yeah. <laughs> that's what you're preserving. You're preserving the intensity of the emotion or the whatever it is. You know, you're preserving that. You're enhancing that. You're doing everything you can to make that be even more amazing than it was originally or at least as amazing as it was originally just don't mess it up don't sure. add stuff just to add stuff love it well i think that's a great spot to wrap up because it definitely sums up a lot of what we've awesome. been talking about here so uh nicholas thank you so much for taking time to be on here really appreciate it mike thank you very much for having me if you want to learn more about you what's the best way for them to do that Hmm. Discogs and um, allmusic.com have a pretty um, good list. There's not much else out there, I feel, in terms of I haven't talked to that many people about the, my process. I had an interview when I first moved to the desert with Justin Coletti, which was funny because I thought recently, and it was like, you're about to build a new studio. And like, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yet and and so um instead i moved um but yeah no i did build a studio so uh i think also i mean you know if people want in a reasonable manner to reach out about specific things as long as it's not super super long you're welcome to write me you can write me at sand to snow at icloud.com the new studio is called Sand to Snow, so it's S-A-N-D-T-O-S-N-O-W at iCloud.com. And I'm always happy if I have time to answer some questions. It comes up, you know, every few months I get an email from somebody about, like, they're working on something, and they, they'd like to ask the person who did it. And, you know, when that doesn't work, I've seen a couple things go around forums. That's an easy way to, because that's public, and everyone gets to share in the answer. That's probably the best way to do it. I just don't really go on forums and say things on forums or read things on forums. I, I'm just working in the studio. Yeah. 
Um, and, uh, but they're very useful. I feel it's just that comes a lot of information, but anyway, sure. thanks for taking the time to, uh, have me on. Mike. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. All right. So that was my episode with Nicholas Varens. And that was really interesting. Like I found it very fascinating how deeply methodical he is about his processes and helping artists, you know, discover who they are and get that energy and that uniqueness and individuality out of their music. So I, I really loved learning more about his processes there. And I also thought it was really fun to learn more about the sonics of his records. And I thought it was very interesting to learn more about his approach to effects and how he likes to automate like thresholds on compressors and stuff like that. That's stuff that you don't normally hear a lot of people talking about. But it's really interesting and it clearly works really well because if you listen to his records, like I know I mentioned the war on drugs in the interview, like if you listen to the lost in the dream record of theirs, man, that record is so awesome and it has so much spaciness and size and ambience to it. But yet it's so clear and every element has its own clarity and its own space in the mix. So it's it's very fascinating to learn more about how he approaches processing his effects and to get that granular with things like automating thresholds and stuff like that. Um, it's it's definitely something that, you know, the, the work speaks for itself. You know, when you listen to those records, they sound really, really good. So um, it clearly works. And it's an interesting thing to experiment with if you've never done that before. So certainly try it out. I know I'm going to be trying it out. I love the idea of, you know, compressing a chorus a little bit differently than a verse and, um, I think that that is a really interesting way to just create subtle changes or sometimes even really big changes that have to happen in order to get the most energy out of the individual individual parts of a song. So I think that's really cool. So with that said, I hope that you enjoyed this episode. I hope you found it very fascinating and that you learned a lot from it. And if you're the type of person who has been working on your music and maybe you've you got this sound in mind of what you want to achieve with your songs, but you're not quite certain of how to actually get there. And you need someone who can hold your hand and walk you through the entire recording, editing, and mixing process to help make your vision come to life. If that sounds like you, then I would love to work with you on your music. And inside of my coaching program, Amplitude, I work one-on-one -on -one with my students and help dig into your mixes and help you establish what is it that you want your music to sound like and how can we get your music to get there? You know, what do we need to do with EQ, compression, all that kind of stuff? I work with you to help you get the results that you want. So if you're interested in getting getting personal help throughout the entire process to feel confident that your music sounds exactly the way you've always envisioned it, then make sure to visit masteryourmix.com forward slash amplitude. And that's where you can find all the details of the program. And then I'd love to hop on a call with you. I'd love to learn more about your process, your goals, and to see how I can help you. And if it seems like I can truly help you, then I will invite you to work with me inside of this program. And I only work with people who I truly believe I can help. And if it doesn't seem like a good fit, no worries. I'll let you know. But if you are interested in getting help, once again, make sure to visit masteryourmix.com forward slash amplitude, and you can find out all the details there. So with that said, we've reached the end of this episode. Thank you so much for sticking around, and I can't wait to chat with you in the next one. Talk soon. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at masteryourmix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit MasterYourMix.com.